Welcome to Ready Layer 2 with me, Git. Small. This is a podcast for the founders, innovators, and experimenters building the future of Web3 on Arbitrum. Hey everybody, welcome to the Ready Layer 2 podcast. I'm your host, Git. Small. You can call me Don. And today I'm going to be joined by Huff from the Pair Protocol. Huff, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be here. Yeah, man, I appreciate you taking the time. I've been following your work for some time, played around with the protocol a bit during your beta phase, and uh, definitely have been a big fan of your podcast, the Crypto Narratives podcast that you've been running for a while. Just great trading conversations, which is an area for me that I am still very novice in, I'd say, and growing. So it's been super helpful. So thank you for the work that you do there. But excited to dig into all of that with you here today. If you would, for an intro, let the listener know, basically, how did you get into this type of work? What's your background, expertise, and that type of thing? Yeah, for sure. So I've been in crypto now full-time since 20, 2019. And before that, I was working in investment banking in London. So most of my career has been on the trading floor, trading traditional financial market, so derivatives and options. And then made the transition into crypto in 2019, was managing money for a little period of time. So it was kind of trading and farming on behalf of the other people. And then decided rather than just participate in the markets to actually build an exchange. And that's been the journey of building Pair over the past 18 months. Gotcha. Very good. And what was it about the what you were experiencing or what you were seeing that you felt was lacking or you felt could be done better? Yeah, for sure. So one of the mandates we had was from a... He, an investor wanted just as much return as possible, but for a low level of risk. One of the things we were doing was selling calls for him, so selling volatility. And the other thing that we were doing for that client was doing pair trading. And pair trading is when you long one asset and short another at the same time. And so our two most successful trades for him were around the time of the merge, going long Ethereum and short Ethereum Classic. So being long the proof of stake and short proof of work chain. Um, and then at the time of the FTX collapse, we actually shorted Solana and longed another layer one against it. So we longed Atom and we did very well out of that trade. The process of doing those two pair trades, which were profitable and somewhat market neutral, made us realize what a headache it is. You have to open these individual longs, open these individual shorts. You've got to manually calculate p &L. You've got to go and chart it separately on trading view. You've got to post collateral against each leg. Yada, yada. And it didn't matter if you were doing it on DYDX, on Vertex, on Binance or KuCoin or whatever, just pair trading was a nightmare. And so the idea for pair and the genesis of pair is very much eating our own dog food. It's a product we needed to see and use ourselves and that's how it was born. I'd like to say I'm always going to be its first user. Gotcha. Very cool. And that's the best products are born out of that, like solving your own problem and doing it well and then doing it so well that you can launch it out and share it with the world. So that's a common journey that I've come across in Web3 and really any industry. So very cool. And what are the, like you touched on it a little bit there, but what are the, the specific problems or bugaboos that you run into when you're trying to do pair trading? Is it really about optimizing the leverage between the long and the short side or backing them all up? What are the things that make it difficult to do that on your own? Yeah, so the main kind of challenge when pair trading is actually more operational. It's manually clicking these buttons, right, and opening these trades. And you have some kind of slippage risk as well, because if you want to enter, let's say, an, a somewhat esoteric pair like long link and short pith, you'd actually have to, in Binance, go into the link charting universe, long link, and then go into the pith chart, short pith. And so that all takes time. It's an operational hassle. And then the second kind of hassle is, like you said, yes, leverage is part of that, but it's just like managing the P&L, managing the risk and knowing what your risk is. Because if you have one pair trade, it's reasonable. Like it's reasonable to manage it. And people talking about EFSOL or Pepe Doge or something, right? Mm -hmm. but the minute you start to build a portfolio of pair trades, what somebody like maybe Anteater or some of these other big pair traders on Twitter do, it, it becomes really difficult to manage unless you've got some kind of institutional style set up. And so... We really wanted to democratize access to that. So that's, yeah, the essence behind, behind how Got we it. built it. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And as, uh, like I said, I tried out a decent amount in the beta phase. And for me, th this not being an area of expertise for me, the idea of doing all of those steps you just said would be, that would be complicated. And I was able to get in there like with very little effort and set some of these trades up and 
see what was going on, keep track of what was going on with them and manage the leverage and close them out when I wanted to, like all in one step at a time. So it was definitely useful for me as a novice trader. I imagine experts would get value out of too. So that's kind of my next question is who are your, who's your target user? Who do you think this platform really is for? So right now we have a bit of a barbell approach, meaning on the left-hand side of the barbell are retail traders who are really hot on narratives. And so a narrative might start to form like long Pepe and short Doge, and they want to express that. And so pair becomes a, an interesting vehicle for them to do that. And obviously we offer leverage, right? So for the kind of average retail trader cares about capital efficiency and they care about trading narratives and leveraging their views. Pair caters to that very well. We've made the UI and the UX very simple to use. We've tried to minimize the kind of frills involved and we've made charting and monitoring a position really easy. And then on the right hand side of the spectrum, you've got some liquid token funds and more institutional users who want to take these market neutral trades and they understand the premise and they can build a big fundamental thesis for that. And so for them, we're working on trade reporting and execution APIs so they can directly trade on pair. And, and our tokenomics will be such that the bigger the client, kind of lower the fee model becomes as well. So I guess in essence, those are our two like main user bases. But in between, there's really like a, a whole host of people that potentially could use something like Pair. And when you say, is there a, an ideal user? Not really. Like anybody should be able to use Pair to augment their trading at some point. All right. Very good. And when you set out to do this, so obviously you were building the solution to your own problem and what you were trying to execute on. When you set out to start building it, what did that process look like? What it was, what resources did you need? What was the team makeup? What was the skill sets that were necessary, et cetera? Yeah, thankfully a lot of us had worked together on a previous crypto project. So the biggest issue in crypto and building a crypto project is having a team and finding like-minded people. So we were very fortunate in the sense that we had all worked together over a number of months and years on the previous crypto project where we were doing all this kind of yield farming and things. So finding the team was natural and in place of sorts. The other thing was users, right? So for us, we had a loyal community of people who were part of our previous project and were happy to test and be beta testers of that pro of pair. And so that was another natural advantage. And then we were just leveraging networks that we had as well. I'd got to know a lot of people in crypto over time. I'd got to know a lot of people through the podcast, potential users and whatnot. And I think there was just like this air of, hey, we've been like out there sharing knowledge for the past however long, like about farming on chain or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and people were reciprocal with that. And they were like, oh, let me try your platform. This is what I'd like to see. This is what pair trading looks like for me. These are the challenges I'm having. So those were the first steps to really build an MVP, get feedback and really utilize the networks that we'd already cultivated just through, through spreading awareness. Gotcha. Yeah, that that concept of kind of building your network ahead of time because you were already out there providing value to people and creating people that, you know, had goodwill towards you and, and really anything that you brought to them, if it was remotely interesting, they might have been willing to take a look at it. So that that concept definitely has worked for me over the years. It's one of the reasons why getting heavier into this industry, I decided to fire up a podcast because I've had success elsewhere doing that. So I'm just curious, like the, when you mentioned doing the podcasting, is that your crypto narratives podcast that you're referring to there? Did that start prior to pair? Correct. And okay. there's podcast series before that, there was a series before that as well. So a season before that, where we'd interviewed founders of other projects and we'd interviewed prominent traders and the like. So I think in total, I've probably done like 70 or 80 uh, one hour episodes. Oh, very um, nice. With people and never with an ulterior motive. It was always a labor of love. Like. I wanted to speak to these people. I wanted to spread awareness. I wanted to ask them genuine questions. Like it made the door easier to like then follow up and say, Hey, I'm thinking of building a pair trading platform. Do you have 15 minutes? Yeah, no, I love that. Uh, it's definitely, like I said, my experience as well. So let's just touch on, since we're here, we'll touch on that a little bit. You did that podcast with the founders. What made you kick, what made you start doing that in the first place? Was it a learning exercise? Was it, what was the original driver? The original driver was a shower thought. I was, I was in the shower and we were like farming all this stuff in DeFi and people were like coming to us saying, come and like 
deposit on Morpho or come and deposit on on Maple or come and put some liquidity on one of these platforms. And so as having all these one-to-one calls with protocols and protocol founders about various farming opportunities. And I just realized actually, rather than have these private one-to-one conversations, I could host a podcast where it was almost like a public due diligence call. I was trying to understand the founder, trying to understand their platform, their background, their history, asking kind of questions from the perspective of somebody that would put liquidity onto that platform. And I think that was appreciated in the sense that the tone of the conversation was, hey, you've built this thing. I want to put money in, but I'm skeptical. And that was very much like how it was born as a public due diligence call. Yeah, gotcha. No, I've I've taken similar approaches before in my consulting practice in healthcare. A lot of times the interviews I'm doing were areas that I just, I wanted to learn and I wanted to dig in deeper on, do due diligence on, express we build the network out in that area. So very effective tool. I dig into it a little bit for the listener so that they can potentially put that to use too. But I urge you only do it if you can, like Huff said, do it without ulterior motives. It's a motive to want to learn and to do that due diligence, but always be trying to provide value along the way and and be open and honest about what you, how you're trying to do that. And I think people appreciate it. So bringing us back then from that. So obviously I'll just say to the listeners, the crypto narratives podcast that was born out of that idea and extended that you're running now, just like a super smart trading conversation each time I've listened to it. And I've picked up a ton on it. So I highly recommend people do check that out. We'll link that up down below along with links to parent, et cetera, et cetera. But coming back to the pair protocol, then in those early days, you were solving your own problem. You had access to a lot of the tools and resources you needed already from previous projects, people you were already working with and had a bit of a network to work within. You guys also did a seed round. Just if you could tell us a little about that, like what was the Why did you decide to go down that path and what was the process like? Yeah, so obviously like to bootstrap any project, you need money to pay developers, you need money to do some like baseline level of dev work. And so we decided to raise back in March of last year to raise 1.25 million, a 12.5 million valuation. The process of doing that was, as you'd expect, we spun up a, a deck, we showed it to a couple of people. We got some initial feedback on it and what took a lot of time and admittedly I knew not much about it was just actually like designing deal terms and designing tokenomics, Mm -hmm. cliffs and vesting schedules and trading emissions and all the like. So there was definitely a learning process. Thankfully, I reached out to a couple of people who were somewhat tokenomic experts so they could help as well. And essentially we used word of mouth to reach out to a whole bunch of investors. It was a grueling process and any founder can attest to this, especially what the market was like Um, over a year ago in the midst of the bear market. It was just calls after calls and people with a huge resistance to parting ways with cold hard cash. So probably like a conversion ratio of less than 5% for each call that we had to investor. But yeah, just tons and tons of calls, lots of time wasters, lots of people who just like taking notes because that's their job. But ultimately, we connect to with the right people. Gotcha. Very cool. And to to a listener out there that's in that, maybe coming up on that, how, what piece of advice would you offer to a founder going into it for the first time based on your experience, things you've learned, pitfalls to avoid, anything along those lines? Yeah, something we didn't do, and I it was partly due to the market context, is we didn't find a lead investor, which meant finding subsequent investors was more difficult. So we ended up doing a party okay. round where lots of people invested like 100K or 50K or 25K or whatever it was, right? Rather than one big ticket for half a million and they sourced the other investors. I would have done more, I would have done the deck more oriented at finding a lead investor. And I would have made the terms such that as a lead investor, they got XYZ benefits. And in doing so, they would also help lead the round and get other people into it as well. It would have saved a lot of time. It would have been a bit more economic. Obviously, I had to deal with the market as it was at the time. The other thing about raising and finding a lead investor is some of the bigger houses, the bigger VC houses, they want like minimum ticket size of 5, 10 million. So I would have just asked for more (laughs) as well. Got it. At the time, I think that was one of the challenges we had because we were raising this kind of in-between amount of 1.25. A lot of the conversations just ended like the round's too small for us to potentially lead it. 
not enough potential upside there. I've been told by a lot of founders that have been through the process that you have to allow the investors' imaginations to run away with them a little bit. And yes. if the, the stakes are too small, it just yeah, it gives them less space to play in their minds, which is an interesting way to think about it, but it does make sense. Yeah, and I'd, okay. put, on, I'd put on my like banker hat. So something I did maybe wrong a little bit is we had a full, because we're a DEX and we have like revenues, I put on like a full financial model of how much this product could make. And I was really conservative with the assumptions. And hmm. I thought that would be appreciated to be conservative. And clearly like it wasn't the biggest pushback we got is we think the market for pair trading is really small. And so we'll pass on the opportunity. Got it. Okay. But you got it done. So you persevered, lots of calls, you got done, you were, had the resources you need to continue on. Tell me about that next one year process between then and now, where you guys have recently launched full production, I got a beta. What have been, what's been the biggest challenges you've faced along the way to getting this thing live? Yeah. So I think things have definitely taken longer than we were expecting. And that's been the real challenge on the dev side in terms of managing our own kind of expectations we were in like a closed beta for way longer than we thought we initially thought we needed six weeks to just collect all mm -hmm. the feedback from people and implement the changes that process actually was more like six months um, okay for what what made it take so long i think we underestimated that your version 0 0.5 like the most base version of what you're going to do once you open out to 200 people you're going to get like 200 different issues that people see. Some of them yep. are critical. Some of them are like, can you make this a rounded corner? And it's tough to like, <laughs> it's tough to please everybody, but some of the feedback is really valid. And I think what happens is even if you have a fully stocked dev team, you can't just work on all the issues at once. You have to go through them systematically. One issue might take two days. Something that you think is relatively innocuous and should take 30 minutes can end up taking two weeks, right? Charting was one right. of them which just took way longer than we had initially anticipated. And so I think I would have managed expectations for myself a bit better and then externally as well. Okay. Got it. Yeah, sure. For You say for yourself, that's actually a really important one there is just maintaining your own mind space throughout the project. So tell me about that. I think that could be very helpful to another founder out there, would be founder is, you know, what specifically, like what was difficult for you and what did that, what kind of struggles did that create for you? And then how'd you deal with that? Yeah. So I think one of the big kind of challenges we, you get in any community is people come in and they say, when platform, when token, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I really understand it. If someone has invested money and time in a project, they want to know these key things because community really galvanizes around those two questions, when platform, when token. And I get it, right? If you think about any kind of way of building tribes, they have to form around a common cause and that common cause is let's get this platform done and let's get the token out there to people. Yep. I think I would have communicated and managed expectations a bit better uh, and said, look, I don't know how long these dev things are going to say. Whereas one, the temptation was always like to say, oh, this Friday we'll have an update. Or we used to write articles and be like, oh, bye. September X, we're going to be doing these things. And one thing I learned from dealing with our devs who are amazing is putting that kind of pressure on them is just going to affect their quality of work. It's going to affect their motivation. It's going to affect, they're going to cut corners in certain places yep. and they're going to lead to burnout of sorts as well. It's okay to have deadlines and be like, dude, get this done by September 9th. Cause I'm going to New York for this conference. And I'm demoing. That's one type of pressure. But it's unfair pressure to be like, dude, I need all this by 24 hours ago, especially right. when you're not a, not a coder yourself. Uh, and that was a challenge. That was a challenge. And I wish I'd listened to them a little bit more in terms of, yeah, just not communicating deadlines firmly externally. Internally, keep deadlines. It's the way any business is run. But externally, okay. being a bit more mindful on that. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And one of the things, one of the topics that's keep coming up around this is the idea of building out in the open versus not. And obviously there's extremes to that, right? Like you could announce that you're doing something and then disappear until you have something to show, or you can announce that you're doing something and show at full kimono, show everybody what's going on every step of the way, and then somewhere in between. And I think what you just described there is at least starts to strike an interesting balance where you do want to keep pressure on yourselves, you and your team, 
everybody needs a little bit of motivation to, to really hit things hard, but you want to do it in a good way that doesn't create unnecessary pressure and make the, at some, on some level, make you feel bad out in public. That's never good when you start missing those public deadlines. So yeah. I think that's an interesting thing for the would-be founder to be listening to and thinking about here. Um, and in general, my background is in development and I ran pretty large dev teams, like 30, 35 developers. And it is definitely a fine line. If you don't put any pressure on people, you're going to get, you're going to get very slow work. But if you put too much pressure on people, it's going to go poorly. Um, as you described there, you can lead to mistakes, burnout, people just not enjoying their experience. So to, to me, the important thing is to make sure that everybody on the team is kind of, is on, just on board with the mission, right? If your devs want to get it done because they want to have it ready for you to take to the conference in New York next week, that's a better place to get. Mm -hmm. So what have you guys done along those lines or have you found any particular ways of really just engaging the team and really getting them to want to to buy into the mission and really want to move things forward on their own accord. Yeah, I think one of the greatest things about us as a team is people really gel over like what makes our team unique. And what makes our team unique is we're not just forking like another Aave fork or we're not mm -hmm. walking GMX or something. We're building something brand new. And as technically challenged as that can be at times, I think everyone in the team is of the mindset, let's actually do DeFi. Let's do something you can't do on a centralized exchange like Binance. Yep. And there's been chop and change in the dev team for people who like just saw it as a job. And we've really aligned with the people who align with the vision, right? They want to build something cool that will last the test of time and bring something new to the game. So the first thing was, yes, there was chop and change and people who were in it for just the salary ended up leaving and we got new people in and the energy was a lot better. The second thing is I'm super passionate about education, right? So if I wasn't doing this, I would be a teacher somewhere. That's what I would okay. be doing with my time. And I really conveyed to people that, look, I don't just want people to come and use pair. I want to educate people about pair trading. I'm sick and tired of getting DMs from people saying, oh, dude, I got liquidated. I got liquidated. I got liquidated. Mm. I bought some meme coin or whatever. If our space is going to evolve from being like a pump and dump space or a space where 1% make 90% of all the money, then you need people and teams who really believe in the mission of not just building cool tech, but also building stuff where people can make money from doing it. And that education thing really rings at the heart of everybody in the team. So yes, we like aligned around that mission of building cool tech, but also like educating people in the process. Gotcha. Now in terms of the early churn where people, you didn't quite have that alignment yet, was that something that just occurred naturally or is that something did you and the rest of the team somehow facilitate that churn, if you will, and encourage the people who aren't fitting to move along. How, what was that process like? It was actually quite natural. People air their frustrations and you come to a mutual understanding quite quickly. And we're not talking like masses and masses of turnover of people, like maybe two or three individuals, but okay. it's amazing how like replacing two or three key people with two new people <laughs> just completely changes the energy and the vibe. Absolutely. And my advice, if this conversation is tilting towards advice for other founders, is you know when someone is sapping energy from the project. Yep. And I'm all for being mindful, I'm all for being compassionate, but if you give people breathing room and they don't take it, and you give them some rope and they don't take it, it's actually, you know what to do. You don't need to put yep. in it, you need to get that new person in. And you need to do it for the sake of the project. And, and it's investors and it's stakeholders. Forget your personal relationship with this person. Forget like having to have an awkward conversation. Like you need to be, you need to really do that. And I got better at that over time. Yep. hundred percent. I'll echo that all day because nobody wants to fire somebody. Nobody wants to be hypercritical of somebody, but yeah, like when it needs to be done, you do know it. That's 100% certain. And a lot, what I've seen more often than not is people procrastinate on taking care of a problem with the team and then eventually the problem takes care of itself because it always does. They'll eventually leave on their own. And then they're like, oh, thank God. I'm so happy this is over with. I'm so happy that person's gone. So if that's how you're going to feel when they leave, you should have taken care of it. And the other thing I'd say too is I agree. You don't want to be compassionate. You don't want to just drive people and in my way or the highway, nothing like that. But if they're not working, addressing that very often works out well for them too, right? If it's not going to work out, it ain't going to work out. It's better off for everybody to move on and try to find the thing that is going to work. 
when it's true for your team and for that individual. So 100% echo you on that one. Moving on then. So you guys, you had the longer beta period than you, you talked about. I'm just curious too, I actually haven't asked you this about like, how big is the team today for Pair Protocol? Like how many people do you have actively working on this thing? And in what roles are they working? Yeah, for sure. So I'm in a founder capacity. We have a team of devs who are full-time and internal. Three of them are based in Nigeria. Uh, we've got another developer based in between Kenya and India. And then a final uh, developer in South America. So five on the dev side. On the business side, including myself, we've got another four people in either each with their own roles, either partnership and BD, community leading, somebody doing kind of Discord moderation stuff, and then somebody taking care of like finance and legals and things like that. So I think in total it's 10 or 11, depending okay. on how you slice or dice it. We have had more devs up until recently. It was very clearly communicated with them that they were on a short-term contract for a few months. And once that got hit, then we migrated to the stage we're at now. Gotcha. Very good. And the stage you're at now, so you are live, right? You guys went live probably within the last month or so, I would think. Exactly that, yeah. We we went live oh, just over 10 days ago. So, yeah, just about. Oh, awesome. Week. Congrats on that. And what's the experience been so far? How have the last 10 days been for you and the team? Really great. Bear in mind, we're doing something brand new and novel and, and people are not that aware outside of ETHBTC that you can do this kind of pair trading. Mm -hmm. We've done 7 million of volume across 1,471 trades and that's 400 unique wallets. In DEX terms, if you compare that to a, a GMX or a Vertex, obviously it's like a fraction of their volumes. Sure. But in terms of a brand new platform doing something brand new and novel on chain, I'm really happy with the number of unique users and how many of them are daily active. And I think what's happening is people are doing like hundred dollar trade. They're testing the platform, seeing how it works, mm -hmm. opening it, closing it, monitoring it, digesting some more educational information and scaling up as they take profit. And so that's really encouraging for us is seeing those good. users. Yeah. Yeah, sure. That makes good sense, right? They're building trust in the platform, making sure it's going to work when they need it to. Because obviously trading, very time sensitive. If things don't work when they come and hit those buttons, that's that's going to be bad quickly. So it makes sense for them to test it out that way. And what? so there's two different ways that you guys offer the trading right now too, right? Two different ways to manage the leverage or talk about the platform itself. Yeah, for sure. So there's ultimately the biggest thing with pair trading is where do you get your liquidity from? Because obviously someone needs to, let's say an example of Pepe Doge, they need to go long a Doge perp and short a... So long a Pepe perp and go short a Doge perp, right? Now, Arbitrum is our home. We chose Arbitrum for a reason because it's the home of Perpetual's trading and there is deep liquidity available on Arbitrum as well. The first integration we have is with GMX, GMX B2. We've got 15 underlines there. Users can go and do some of those trades like long ETH and short Doge or long Sol, short ETH or whatever it might be. And that's in isolated margin mode, meaning you do run the risk of potentially being liquidated on one of the legs because the two legs are not in cross. And that's one of the limitations of GMX. There are some mm -hmm. benefits of GMX. Higher leverage is one of them. Another one is you can have these unique edge cases where uh, you can get liquidated on one leg and just ride the long or ride the short, which some people are using the platform for, as well as a few other reasons for using GMX, including obviously if you're part of the ecosystem and earning all the tokens on. Side. Our second integration is with Vertex. And so Vertex, we've integrated with their SDK, their software development kit, which taps directly into their order book. And so we source our liquidity from the order book. So in the case of Pepe, you would be long at market Pepe perps and short Doge. And we tokenize and move that trade into one tokenized trading position for you. And all those trades are in cross margin, meaning if you're long Pepe and short Doge and the market goes up, then you make money on Pepe, you lose a bit on your Doge, but net, you'll be up. And vice versa, if the market goes down, you make money on the short doge and hopefully you've lost not as much half on the short Pepe leg as well. So that's the, that's that integration. What's coming third and lastly is our integration with SIN. So SIN is an intent centric model for intent centric solver model for perps with market makers on the back end. Ultimately how that works is a user comes, they say, I want to be long Pepe and short doge. And on the back end, a solver, a market maker is actually fulfilling that order. The benefit there is you can have access to way more underlying. So about 250 underlyings. You can be a lot more flexible with how you execute your trade, including potentially TWAP and VWAP orders. 
you might be able to do something like being 70% long and 30% short. It's just fully flexible. And the way I like to think of SIM is like an on-chain OTC desk. Okay. And, and I trade it kind of to pairs front end and be like, hey, this is what I believe is going to happen. This is how I want to execute it. Kind of solve and do it for me. Got it. Very cool. Now, is that the thing I saw you guys tweeted today about thematic baskets coming out? Is that related to what you're talking about now? That's actually our integration with with Vertex. So we've got these baskets that you can trade. So you could be long a basket of memes and short, let's say, Bitcoin or something against it. Okay. And that's been created in partnership with the likes of Wintermute and Vertex to provide that deep liquidity. Okay. So that's an interesting way to say, like you're talking about narratives. If it's you know, you're going into a hot meme season to pick up the basket of memes against a BTC or something like that, just because you expect it to outperform in the market, that would be the use of that, right? Exactly. Okay. That's very cool. And that's certainly, if you're trading against a basket of them, going back to the beginning of it, the manual steps to ask, to execute and manage all of those trades would be tremendous if you're effectively doing a handful of resources against each other. Sorry, a handful of positions against each other like that. So that's pretty cool. And that one, is that live now today too, or is that coming? That is coming soon. Okay. Very cool. Any idea on timelines on that one? Or am <laughs> I asking you to do the thing you said earlier you weren't going to do anymore? Like I, I can, because I'm very confident in where we're at with that. So um, okay. we've got two market makers on the back end. One of which I met recently in London, actually, we did some test transactions last weekend. So it's all working smoothly. So fingers crossed, everything's ready to roll out in the coming weeks. Okay. Awesome. Well, that's exciting news. So you get live, you immediately have new features coming out or shortly after go live, have new features coming out, got people using the platform. So that's, it sounds like all the things are happening that need to be happening. What have you started to get any feedback from the market or your users since coming live the last 10 days? Yeah, I think people really love the UI and the UX. That's the consistent, like positive feedback we get, which is we really okay. love how simple this thing is to use. I think yep. the thing that we can do slightly better and we're continually do that to do that is giving people trading ideas. Cause what happens is people have a strong view. They think, oh, ETH's going to go up or ETH's going to go down, but they don't necessarily know or have a strong view on any other asset like ETH and something like DYDX is a great short against it, right? Huge unlocks coming, not much adoption of their V4, terrible tokenomics. Like it makes sense to be long ETH and short DYDX. And if the market tanks, actually DYDX falls more than ETH. So you make money when the market falls. In ranging markets, you make money because ETH has been very strong of late. And then mm -hmm. in, in markets where the market goes up and you have a day like the other day where ETH goes up 20%, you'll be very happy. And just educating people that those are the kind of trade ideas that we like as a team. It's, a, it's a, one of the challenges, but also one of the big opportunities. Gotcha. Now that just in general, trying to share that type of thinking, if you will, Obviously, everyone's always shouting the NFA, NFA DYOR. How do you balance educating your users about one, obviously how to use the platform, but two, like what are some of the good ideas there? How do you balance that out so that you're not taking any of that risk of coming off as of give, giving people advice, if you will? Yes, yeah, so always NFA, right? And I don't think we need to display merit to death. What okay. we have done is created an entire education hub on our website with articles and videos. And people can oh. go there and make up their own minds about what they're doing. As opposed as when it comes to like trading ideas and the trading floor, which is one of the servers in our discord, the trading floor is like completely crowdsourced. I mean, different people are coming in there debating ideas. Uh, oh, nice. Okay. It's quite an active community and team members are part of that. It's not some, not led from the top. Oh, Huff things go long, ETH, DYDX. That's not the way we're structuring it. I'll be like, oh, this is interesting. Look at this these stats and somebody can pick apart my argument and so forth. Okay. That makes good sense. And that's a good open way to handle it. And then, yeah, I agree with not necessarily to be always shouting disclaimers. I think sometimes that's a bit overdone. I'm just curious how you think about it. Cause that's a common problem that comes up and obviously you guys are going to be right in the thick of it, given that you're doing, as you said, something a bit unique in the ecosystem that hasn't been done before. You have to educate people. That's going to be a key part of it for sure. Okay. So other things that are coming up. I know you guys, you've got both an ARB STIP grant and a GMX grant. So if you just, I know we're getting close on time here, but I want to touch on these, just share with the listener what you, like how you went about getting those grants and then how those are helping you move, move forward from here. Absolutely. So we've got the kind of full support of Arbitrum and the Arbitrum community. 
So first of all, we got a GMX Builder Grant, which was worth 40,000 ARB tokens to build and integrate with GMX V2. The best part of that process is we got close to the GMX devs. We got to really work closely with them on building the best kind of product there. And the tokens that we got as part of that, we're using to incentivize trading. You can essentially come to pair, trade on isolated margin mode, and get up to 80% of your fees back in ARB tokens. And those are tokens which we've got from GMX exclusively. And so they're directed to the isolated engine. The STIP, or rather the LTIP, uh, STIP we didn't, we weren't eligible for because we hadn't launched. But the LTIP recently, we were awarded up to 350,000 ARB tokens. And so, two seconds. Yes, so as part of that, we... We, we will be incentivizing trading on all our products, whether it's the intent-based trading, whether it's cross-margin mode or whether it's isolated mode. And essentially the way that is structured is similar, meaning that users can... Sorry, I was just trying to put on a pair trade of FBTC at the moment. Meaning that you... Dog, dog fooding as we speak, I love oh, it. Oh yeah, dude, 100%. Like, 100% that. Yeah, so the... Where's my argument? The same mechanics there. So you trade on pair, you incur some fees, and then you'll receive eighty percent of those back as a as Arbitrum tokens. Okay, very good. So you're basically incentivized and in, by way of getting your fees back. That's yeah, that's definitely a win. I love that. And how long will both of those go on for? Is it just until the funds run out, or is there timelines associated with them? Yeah, so it's a twelve week incentive program. So it'll be for for that period. Got it. Okay. And the end game of both of those or the goal of both of those is just to increase users, right? Is that basically what both GMX and Arbitrum are trying to drive with that? Exactly that, yeah. So the okay. LTIP is there. So it's the long-term incentives program. So it's been mm -hmm. designed for people to come to Arbitrum, try out pair trading in a relatively like zero cost, almost zero cost kind of manner because yep. of the rebates. And we hope that they like come to, for, to, and try the platform. And then they'll stay because of the superior technology, the education, the fact you can actually make money in this, like any market scenario, regardless of yeah, if it's good. That yeah, makes good sense. Get them in to try it. And if it's good, hopefully they stick around. It makes good sense to me. So on the way out, what's next for Pair Protocol and where can people go to, to get connected with you online, learn more about the platform, et cetera? Yeah, for sure. So I think the best resource is going to be our Twitter in terms of official communication. So just Pair yep. or Protocol. If you don't follow it already, there's a link tree there, which will direct you to our discord where servers like the trading floor are there, pair talk is there. And there's a whole bunch of other servers there based on whether you want to talk about the protocol or whether you want to talk about something else as it pertains to pair. And then lastly, you could even try it yourself. So if you just go to beta.pair.garden, we're live on Arbitrum mainnet. V1 of our contracts was audited by Shieldify. The ARB incentives are there and there's over $400,000 worth of ARB incentives to claim and try. And yeah, the best way to get involved with Pair outside of following us on Discord and Twitter is to actually go to beta.pair.garden and claim it. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. And that's what I did a few months ago back in the beta release. Just went in there, started trying out a few small trades and not hard to pick up and immediately gives you some interesting ideas about things you can do. So do recommend you all check it out. For you, those of you on Sanko right now, there I just dropped that Twitter link into the comments so you can check them out. But Huff, really appreciate the time here today. Appreciate what you're building. I think it's a great tool, a unique tool for the Arbitrum ecosystem. Congrats for getting it live and congrats on getting some grant funding and some attention. And yeah, just really appreciate you coming and telling us all about it today. Wow, I love the forum and I appreciate the work you're doing as well and keep spreading the word keep interviewing people keep sharing these founder stories because it's something i wish i had when when i was starting out so real kudos to you guys for doing that absolutely yep trying to get that information out there because now building stuff is tough and if we can take any of the edge off that's what we're trying to do thanks for helping us with that again and uh, yeah to the listener also check out huff's podcast especially if you're interested in trading like i said just super smart trading conversations with people who are doing it all day long and obviously Huff, what you're talking about. So you plus a good guest makes for a great listen. I strongly recommend that. That's the Crypto Narratives podcast. Look for that in the show notes as well. And that's, that's it for us here today. So thank you to Huff. 
Thank you to those of you who tuned in live here on Sanko TV. And for the rest of you, we'll see you next time on Ready Layer 2. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Ready Layer 2. If you're an Arbitrum builder with a story to share, then hit me up on Twitter at GitSmall, G-I-T-S-M-O-L. Learn more at GitSmall.com.